to the Make It True Anthology panel. I'm Nadine Maestas, and I'll be the moderator of these amazing gentlemen here. Uh, so, first I'd like to uh, thank the Snunemu. 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 I just have to practice that so much more before my next panel. Snunemu people on whose traditional territory we are gathered. Uh, thanks for sharing land with us. Uh, I'd also like to thank Vancouver Island University for providing space and support. Um, and the Vancouver Island University Faculty of Arts and Humanities for their generous donation and financial assistance. Uh, we'd also like to thank the Nanaimo Tourism Department Fund, Development Fund, sorry, the Canada Council for the Arts, the League of Canadian Poets, the Writers' Union of Canada, and Cascadia. Cascadia now for their funding. <clears throat> also, our many sponsors, which are tons of them, um, whose lo logos are on the program, so please like look at the logos, and then when you go out about town shopping, try and patronize some of these businesses. Am I too, too close to this thing? It's like this thing. Just keep it further away from okay. the Okay, let me see. All right. Who's my feedback on here? Okay. Okay. Maybe I can stand back here. That's better, isn't it? Yeah. No, sort of. Okay. <laughs> Feedback it is. Okay. Um, so I'm going to introduce each of these gentlemen and then I'm going to say a few things about the anthology um, and some of the impetuses that brought it forth. Um, okay, so this is Paul Nelson. Paul Nelson is the founder of Splab, which now is, goes by the Seattle Poetics Lab. Um, it's been around for 21 years now. 21 years, and we just had the 20th year anniversary party last year. Um, also, Paul is the instigator of this very festival. So the first one was in Columbia City, and the second one, if you were there last year, was at Seattle University and Spring Street Center. Um, and then of course, we're grateful for the Nanaimo uh, committee to have put all of this together. It really is amazing. Um, so he's really the father of this idea um, for the Cascadia Poetry Festival. And thinking about curating in a bioregional way, that's really, really different. Um, when Paul first came to me with this idea, I was like, man, that's a radical idea. Um, and I want to be a part of it. This sounds like a great idea. Um, so it's grateful to be invited um, into this project. So uh, this is Barry McKinnon. His countless books, which you can find on his website or or others. I don't have a website. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it was. I just thought it was somebody else's. I'm a print man. Somebody else's <laughs> blurbs about you. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, there is a print man then. Um, and this is actually the first time I've met Barry in person. Uh, previously, I had only communicated with him uh, through the internet and email and whatnot about this particular project, but it's been a real pleasure uh, to work with him. Uh, and this is George Stanley. I don't have a website either. <laughs> <laughs> he is a website. <laughs> um, George, actually, if you were at the last Cascadia uh, Poetry Festival and at the Innovative Poetics panel, which I also moderated, uh, George made some particular remarks about the future of poetry and where maybe where it's going. Um, that got a lot of people excited in different directions at times. And, uh, and what he said at that panel was really influential to all of us in terms of making this book, making it happen, and uh, really bringing it to fruit. Uh, so we're really grateful uh, to George for that in particular, uh, not just the entire body of his work. But he, this is the anthology here, uh, and it literally is like hot off the press. Uh, I think it just showed up this morning. Um, you can buy it outside for 30 Canadian dollars. Um, it's not that much for an anthology, actually. It's quite cheap. Uh, and uh, what was the other thing I was going to say? So, one of the things that George talked about at the last Cascadia Poetry Festival, which I want to mention, is uh, where poetry might be going. And one of the comments that he made was about um, being against irony, that there's something in the world of poetry today 
um, that there's been a lot of irony in, in people's works, and that perhaps the next step is for us to not do irony. In fact, try something else. And what I took from that uh, is that there's a call for, for intimacy and connection. Right? And something uh, McCloskey was just talking about, the kind of connection with the land, and maybe an intimate connection with the land that might bind us all together um, in some way, right? Um, and George made this comment about poetry at this particular bioregional festival last year. Uh, so that's definitely something to think about in terms of where poetry is going and maybe what the feel of things are, maybe where you want poetry to go. Um, irony is really fun, but maybe it's been overdone, right? Um, maybe some of these really artificial uh, experimental practices have run the, their route for now, and they've done their job. And maybe now it's time for us to return to something that's very honest and very deep and very truthful and very scary, and that we shouldn't actually really be afraid of that, but that we should be brave enough to touch it and to handle it and to feel it and to write about it. So I hope that we'll continue this work, and I hope that you can see some of this in the anthology. My hope for these panels is that they are a dialogue, and so uh, my hope is that the panelists will keep this brief and then respond to questions or suggestions or whatever that comes from the audience. So make it a real discussion. And uh, I'm going to try, I've got a timer here, so I'm going to try to do, do my best to stick to that. I think that the way things happened with George saying what he did last year, which I, and, and George is going to, he's the kind of guy who will jump in if we get something wrong, so I, <laughs> I don't have to urge him to do that. Uh, but what I got from what he was saying on the Innovative Poetics panel at the last Cascadia was, what we suffer from now is the tyranny of irony in contemporary poetry. And so, uh, you know, it's nice to be able to knock something down, but how do you build something? How do you go to a deeper level and say what you love about something? And, and you know, really make yourself vulnerable. And I think in a lot of uh, poetry settings, that's, a, uh, that's not a fashionable thing to do, but I think it's a necessary thing, considering some of the conversation that we had in the last panel, that we're looking at, uh, you know, the corruption of the, the very biosphere. So what an amazing time in which we live. Isn't that the Chinese curse? May you live in interesting times where we have them. So um, the idea of the, for the anthology was really um, a combination of a deep desire to learn about this place in which I live. I don't know it. In fact, as you saw in the earlier panel, I'm not even asking the right questions. <laughs> and uh, But hanging around with people who are asking interesting questions, like Sam Hamill, and, and uh, like David McCloskey, and like Daphne Marlad, and like George Bowring, who we hope is, uh, is doing well now. And the, the people who've been doing it for a while, that's when you start to get into some interesting territory. And so the notion of uh, combining those two things, bioregionalism uh, and that narrative that one person can't do, that's a mosaic. In fact, the, narrative, the, the, the anthology itself is a weave of many different takes on it. The, the folks who might be considered more quote-unquote nature poets, uh, the folks who might be considered more, uh, more quote-unquote experimental poets. I think you can take a little bit from them and from this whole book, even though this book is just a fragment, begin to get a better sense of the place in which we live and the people who are writing, uh, you know, in, in a way that uh, is connected to, to different levels, deeply connected to this place. And what is the culture of Cascadia? You know, why do we recycle more? Is it because we're amidst all this uh, beautiful scenery, the glaciers, the mountains, the ice fields, the fjords, the hot springs, the volcanoes, the craggy coastlines, and on and on and on? Uh, the I-5. Oh, I mean, <laughs> and, and to look at it and to not have an idyllic view of just everything, but also a realistic view of everything. Uh, what is with the passive-aggressive streak in Cascadia? I know we get that in Seattle for sure. And I'm told in Vancouver there's a similar thing. So what is, what, what's going on with it? So some of these questions you begin to start thinking about, and like Charles Olson said, you do a saturation job, or as Ed Sanders uh, said, you do a multi-decade research project, and 20 or 30 years, you, you start to get some better questions, I think. So I think this is the beginning of that process, and uh, working with these people is wonderful. Uh, working with Ursula. Yeah. Ursula, by the way, is an incredible gift for this community. Yeah. 
hats off to get this thing done and get it done in a, in a beautiful way. And I think the, the, the book reflects her uh, at, at least as very much as any of the people at this panel. So I'm grateful to Ursula for taking it on and for doing the great work that she did. And I'm also grateful for the poets who, uh, who ended up in here. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that not everybody could have been in here. It's always the question of why isn't this person in or why didn't you do this? But uh, I, I'm very grateful to those poets who didn't know me. I got a, you know, it's like a friend of a friend is asking you for poems, do you send it? And the people who are in here, they did send it. And uh, so we're very grateful uh, that they're in and uh, that we have people who've been doing, who've been writing for 30, 40 years. Uh, people on this panel, uh, Sam Hamill, Daphne Marlad, Fred Watt, you know, uh, Jim Dodge in Southern Cascadia in Arcata, California. And uh, we're not as connected as we like to be, but this is a first step in that. This is the beginning of the conversation, and hopefully things will come from this poetry festival that will continue the dialogue, that will deepen the dialogue, and that will give us a sense of some of the better questions. So. Uh, I drove down here from Prince George in a 1988 uh, Buick. That car goes, man. It's great. <laughs> and while I was driving, I, I don't text. Uh, but I was writing notes while I'm driving. I can't bear, I can barely read them now. Uh, this isn't to say I had any intention of saying much, uh, other than you know rambling through a few few things that were occurring, particularly on in the Duffy Lake Road, where if you're writing and driving at the same time, you're pretty much screwed. Uh, it's a good road. Uh, but I heard Philip Glass. Uh, speak on the radio a couple of weeks back, and I don't know if people heard that, but he, he's an incredible musician. And uh, I think what I sensed from him was that he's trying, at the age of 78 years old, trying to get back to, to a kind of simpler way of looking at the world. But that's not to say it's not complicated, or that he hasn't had a huge uh, extended experience coming to these points of, as Korea would say, knowledge uh, rather than wisdom. But he said that, uh, all, when he was 16, he asked himself, what, what is music? Because this is what was driving him. And over the years, he thought, well, it's harmony, it's melody, it's rhythm, it's you know, pretty much the standard uh, kinds of things you probably study in a university situation. Then he gave a talk at a, a, probably a high school, like he was saying. The kid put up his hand and said, Mr. Glass, what is music? And he said, music is a place. And I thought, you know, that solves an incredible amount of of uh, something in my life, because poetry is a place. And I think that the anthology and the writing we've been trying to do is, is a, an extension of uh, really William Carlos Williams' notion that uh, only the imagination is real. So you're in your imagination when you're, when you're writing, and it's a place. But he said, you're not always in that place. Like, now I'm in the Nine, right? uh, which is a literal, physical place. But it could, you know, the details here and experience could inform a poem no doubt about that. I've been living in California for a bit, and uh, I find that you know, the desert is, is just feeding me these lines, and I'll try to read some of that material tonight. Um, so that was interesting to me, what Philip Glass said. Uh, what else did I write down here? In terms of, Emil Alcalé is a New York writer, and I do have a quote from him that I think is gets us thinking about where poetry, maybe where it's been, where it can go back. I think that's a possibility. I started off as a kid reading New American Poetry because I was in the 60s. So I couldn't find too many books in too many bookstores. So I was reading Olson and Creeley and Leonard Cohen, who was visible, and then Irving Layton and, and the Canadians who were uh, publishing at the time. But I loved that writing, and partly because I, I sensed these great, great voices that weren't trained. They weren't, they weren't university professors. They didn't fill you with that fear that you were never going to be able to deal with this work. And rhythmic, funny, uh, grounded in wacky experiences, you know. And uh, listening to John Wieners on, on a tape the other day with Robert Duncan reading the Hotel Wentley poems. Why shouldn't a man of my age weep when I hear a, a great poem? And I did. So it's a wonderful poem, but it's written how many years ago, George? Yeah, it's in the 60s? In San Francisco. Yeah, you know, I can never remember whether it's 50 or 60 years old. ago. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I'm not going to go on for too long here, but I've got, I'll get to the other notes as we maybe go with some questions. But here's Al, Emil Alcalay, quote, 
The miasma that has shrouded the public word and too much of our poetry, made up of careerism, social networking, strict self-policing, and hyper-production, in which information only rarely makes the leap from consciousness to knowledge. Obscurity is a badge of honor. And then he goes on to say that Kenneth Irby took his cue from Charles Olson to, quote, jump into the interior of the land and the self and the sound of language into the mind as it acts in actual space, always measuring signs of the time. Irby's collection, Intent On, is yet another identification of one of the paths not taken in a time of disaster, that point in the 70s after, quote, I, as Ed Dorn so cogently put it in Gunslinger, had left the stage. <laughs> Irby's collection brings us back to a realm of attention Irby had never abandoned and one we are ever more in need of. And then I go on from that to say land, self, sound, mind, meaning a realm of attention. So that, in a nutshell, I guess is my poetic and what I try to practice as a writer. Um, so I'm quoting other people. I'm not very uh, <laughs> smart, actually. <laughs> so if you're in doubt, just read as much as you can. George. Well, uh, Professor McCloskey, is, is it David McCloskey? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. David McCloskey this morning said something which I think is very pertinent to talking about poetry in our time, and that is that we, we're we aware of the local and we're aware of the global, but we, we've lost the intermediate areas of community and, and uh, bioregionalism. Um, I was, what I was going to, I don't know where that goes. Would you mind raising the light, sir? Oh. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. Might not be turned on. That one was turned off. It's probably feedback. Turn it on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure where that takes me, except to re to stress again the importance of the the uh, of place in writing. Uh, I'm not sure I I would agree with the entirely with the passage that Barry just read of Emil Alkali with this idea that obscurity should be a mark of honor. It's a dubious question uh, whether obscurity is, well, whether, whether what, what does, it, it's a question, what does obscurity communicate? I was going to start by saying that I wanted to take back something that I said in Seattle. Oh, great! <laughs> and one, thing I, one thing I said in Seattle, it, it's in those notes too, they're online. I, I quoted uh, W.H. Auden in his uh, elegy on the death of, of Yeats as saying, poetry makes nothing happen. Um, I have a bookmark here. <laughs> which is published by Kiefer Street Press, uh, Meredith and Peter Quartermain in Vancouver. I'll, I'll ask Barry to read the bookmark. Nothing makes nothing happen. <laughs> right, yeah. So I'll take, I, on behalf of W.H. Auden, I'll take that back. <laughs> it's not true. Poetry does make things happen. One thing it can make happen is it, it can make another poem. It was it was the it was Yeats's poetry to a great extent that inspired W. H. Auden to write that poem, in which he said poetry makes nothing happen. Uh, and another thing is that you can learn something from a poem just like you can learn something from a sacred text or from Shakespeare or from a book of philosophy or anywhere. Poet poetry uh, can 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 tell you things that you didn't know before. Um, it's interesting that this idea of irony, I, I certainly agree with, with the emphasis I had placed upon overcoming irony, and I think that's the origin of the title of the anthology, Make It True. Um, I think of Anna Akhmanova, the great Russian poet, in her, she writes in her diary at the age of 70, poems keep coming into my mind and I, and I, keep, I keep driving them away until I hear a genuine line. And I think that, 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 that truth in poetry is 
probably something that you that irony won't get you very far towards towards that kind of truth or genuineness. Uh, but the other thing that I that I mentioned that's in these notes online as well is I was asking that poets give us more realism, and I, and I really want to qualify that because um, realism is a a literary period that that is uh, in the past, really, and uh, you really can't go back to to a uh, to a previous period. If you do, you're simply producing uh, imitations or pastiche of previous work. It occurs, it has occurred to me that you, that there were two major events in the history of poetry that I'm speaking of mainly English language poetry in the 20th century. The first was the, the beginning of modern poetry, and that was the break with the conventions of the 19th century with, the, with metrical form and, and rhyme structures. One of the reasons that, that uh, the poets like T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound broke and William Carlos Williams uh, broke with, with that type of poetry is that there was just so damn much of it. Uh, the, a tremendous number of poets were producing volumes of late, late sentimental, late romantic poetry. It was certainly time for something new to happen. Um, so that was the first big break. It, it, it was when poets took up free verse or vers libre. And the second big break, it occurs to me, took place around the 1970s, and that was when pro poetry broke with meaning. Hmm. Uh, the beginning with the language poets of 1970s and 80s, and continuing to the present, uh, with many, many exceptions, of course, poetry has tended to turn away from a reference to the world. If you go back and read the American po new, new American poets, or their uh, co-evils, the, those who were at that time called academics, poets like uh, Robert Lowell and Elizabeth Bishop, or the new American poets like, say, Allen, Allen Ginsberg, or Charles Olson, you find that in any of those poets, those modernist poets, their poems referred to the actual, to, referred to the actual world. They were about something. And, and with the break that occurs in the 1970s, and which, and which I think characterizes poetry to the present day, the main thing that happens is that the poem is about language. The poet goes out into the, in, in, into the forests of language and, and brings back what she has found there, and, and that is the poem. Uh, and so with, with any of the modernist poets, uh, you could imagine writing, a, if, say, let's, let's take Allen Ginsberg's poem, Howl, about the victims of capitalism. You can, you can imagine someone else writing another poem on that subject. But if a poet simply is writing about what she has discovered in language, there is no subject that anyone else could write about. So it's a, it's a move from reference to the real world to reference to language. And what I was talking about in Seattle, I was saying, well, we that given the fact that we are in an ecological crisis, uh, an economic crisis, a human crisis, it seems unfortunate that poets should not be, so the, the po poets should not be referring to the, the, the real world, which is in crisis, and, and instead referring back to language. In fact, if a poem only refers back to language, there really isn't any way to judge it except aesthetically. And in a sense, it almost seems like the postmodern poetry of the recent three or four decades has taken a leap back to the 19th century to, a, to an idea about poetry called art, art for art's sake. So all of those things made me think that, it, that it's time for, and I think in a very simple-minded way, which I've since corrected, to think that it's time for poets to begin to Refer, back, refer to the real world. But then, then I remembered something, that, something else that had happened in the 1970s, and that was something called the New Formalism. <laughs> I don't know if anyone remembers this. It was, a, it was associated with a poet named Dana Joya. And the idea there was that it was another, another way of breaking with modernism. Uh, 
the successful way was was the language poets. But this was an attempt to to uh, to ask poets to write again in the formal structures of rhyme and meter, and uh, it was a it was a, a, a complete failure because they because poets couldn't do this, and the and the, and the efforts that they made were laughable, and it's just because that time had passed. Uh, it really had passed by the late 19th century when, when, when uh, the poems were verging on reading rhymes, reading card rhymes. Uh, but for a great poet to write in, in uh, metrical structures and, and, and rhyme forms like, say, Shelley, or probably the latest one who could, who could do that, Yeats, You'd have to be. You'd have to do it from age five, and you'd have to be living in a culture where, where, where the poets and other people around you were also writing and, and, and reading poetry of this kind. You don't use think of, thinking about Shelley's great poetry. You really don't imagine Shelley as doing many revisions. That that powerful poetry simply was second nature to him. So the fact that. The, the new formalism, which I caricatured, caricatured as the new formaldehyde, uh, <laughs> was really a failure because it was an attempt to bring back something that had died. Then that made me think, well, I can't really now look at, at all of you who are practicing postmodern poetry, mostly referring, referring to language, and ask you to go back and imitate the moderns. That wouldn't work. It would, it would, it would also be a kind of a... a laughable uh, mistake, uh, kind of a you know, production, like I said, of past issues or, sim or simulations. So what's the answer? Well, the answer is you, you, you can't go back to the past. Whatever poetry there is now does, entire, does, does, does most often emphasize a reference to language. But I think you have to, whatever kind of poetry you're writing, you have to keep the world in mind. That is, you have to be able to find the world in your poems, rather than going back and, 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 and imitating some form of realism from the past. I think you simply have to be aware of, of whatever aspects of the, of the world, and that may be the local ecology or the local economy. Uh, or human relations, uh, or race relations, as as in the U.S. is so so, so strong right now. Those uh, those crucial critical aspects of reality have to be kept in mind, whether whether or not your 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 mode of poetry is directly relate, related to the outside world. Okay. A rewriting of, uh, or an erasure of uh, Allen Ginsberg's poem in the anthology called Al. Um, oh, yeah. Shad, um, Paul may have a couple comments to make. Um, but before we head into to questions uh, on the you know, question dialogue forum, really, uh, I did want to take a little bit of time to talk about the fifth person behind this anthology, which Paul already mentioned, which is Ursula and the press. This would not have happened without Ursula's really hard work and I don't want it to go unrecognized um, and she had quite a quite a journey on it I imagine or really I can't imagine um, and uh, so I just I would really like for us to just take a moment to acknowledge the hard work of the publisher and the press because we maybe had these ideas and we're like we're going to just show up and curate this stuff but Ursula is the one that made it happen in a physical way on paper so that we could distribute people's work, and that is really significant. So can we just please give her a round of applause? So a couple of quick points. Uh, the New American Poetry was brought up. I think that anthology is a model, really, for uh, what I wanted to see happen, and so that's a continuing inspiration, uh, as uh, is the companion, the poetics of the New American Poetry, uh, which are, are both uh, you know, landmark moments in North American poetry, I think. Uh, I also wanted to say very briefly, and I, maybe we'll get into this, that one of the criteria is open. 
you know, I mentioned that poets have to be open enough to want to send their work to a stranger who's, or somebody who's recommended by a friend. Some are more open than others, but that's part of the quality that we see in going ahead, that, that having, a, having an openness to it. And then, as George was talking about Ginsburg being an example of the new American poetry, well, whatever the poetry that they're going to call this, and I don't know if it'll ever get a name, as by way of contrast, so Ginsburg is uh, a out of the closet gay man in the 1950s, relating these things in a very graphic way. Well, we have uh, a person of undetermined gender named Cock Cox, uh, K O K K O X, page 148, and their uh, erasure of Howell is published in this book, and it's called Owl. So, just that cultural shift. Of from Ginsburg to Cox gives you a sense of how the times have changed and how uh, some poets are, are, are attempting to um, to document that. So. Uh, questions? Any questions or points you want to talk about? I'm just wondering if um, you've heard of the anthology edited by Sandy Shreve and Kate Braid in fine form? Because it seemed like you were kind of dissing form poetry a little bit there. And um, <laughs> It's an awesome book, that's all. I'm not, <laughs> I, I, I don't really know what is meant by form. This is the term I've never heard, form poetry. Okay. What is that? With, with meter and rhyme, and there's so many different so, poems. Uh, give me, give me formal one. Formal yeah. Yeah. Well, it's called yeah, that, that, fine that, form. Yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. I meant by the book. They didn't enjoy his move with the new formalism. Okay. And that's what the, that, there was that attempt to do that, to write poetry uh, in traditional metric and rhyme forms. And there may have, I, 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 I was speaking much too generally, there may have been, and may be, a number of poets who have done that quite successfully. But in general, it, there weren't very many people who could do, who could do that. Check out the book. Can I just say something a little about form and meter is like when we talk about form and meter and these kinds of formalisms, what we're really talking about is a European formalism and a European meter. So it's not like these poems don't have meter, we don't have rhymes in these techniques, they're just not European based all the time. And then I think like in American poetry we've actually like moved away from that European tradition, right? I mean this is a form, like that kind of rhyme and meter <laughs> is a form that comes from romantic languages, which is very easy to accomplish in romantic languages, but not in English. So when we did, it was like really special, but that was like way back. So to revisit it, something else has to happen within it to really, I think, move and be successful. And you have to have a readership that can access that. As George, or I think it was George that was saying that. Like you have to have people that can read that stuff in it and can detect it and, right? And then if you don't have that kind of audience, it's really hard to pull it off, right? And I think Robert Duncan said something very interesting, and you know Duncan's kind of a presence uh, because of his uh, influence on the Tisch poets and, and on the Spire region. That comes from San Francisco, which is uh, you know has had an influence on North American West Coast poetry, and uh, you know his his shadow is large. Uh, but he said that when you're writing in a, he was using the word organic back in the early '60s with this with this uh, in his correspondence with Denise Levertov, those old forms can show up there, and and aspects of, uh, of meter and form and everything can't be part of the field. They're just not as strict and the form is more open in the stuff that we're doing rather than the kind of closed meter that I think the new formalism was about. And, uh, and so that's, that's one point. And the fact that there were books like this anthology that you mentioned and Trevor Carolyn's edition of Minota uh, Journal that came out last year and uh, other books that have been done, uh, Pacific Northwestern Spiritual Poetry, for instance, they all covered uh, a lot of ground that we don't have to cover because it's already been done. So to try and find the people who uh, are, uh, you know, there's not one word that really describes the criteria of how people got in this book, uh, but open is one of them. So that's, uh, Duncan, I think, really articulated that we're not abandoning the forms necessarily, but they show up. Anything that the poet was influenced by, even from you know the, the breakfast that they ate, somehow is going to show up. You may not recognize it as a direct influence, but all the things are capable of, uh, of being in there if you're writing in terms of field poetry. It's when you don't know it's breakfast, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 in terms of what George is saying, if anybody's interested in what I consider the failure of 
uh, resurrecting old forms with new content or current modern content. Read the book called The New Canon that came out of uh, Montreal, I believe, in the last couple of years. And it, it's uh, literally using uh, strict old forms, but the rule is that you fill it with, with you know, the, the contemporary every day. And it just, those two issues, it just jars when you read it. And it, it seems sad to me that, that uh, people couldn't break out of that, or, or, or at least were lured into that, because it's, for me, it, it would work in terms of my time. Uh, the other thing um, I was thinking of was uh, something that George was saying too. I've noticed writing lately, it's, it's issue driven. And it kind of bothers me in the sense that, that there, there is a, an overriding subject matter or an issue that people will you know, take 100 pages to deal with. And if I'm not interested in that issue, no matter what it is, because it, you know, it doesn't agree with my politics or my views on the world, then it fails to me as poetry. So I look for, it's not that, I mean, I was thinking, I woke up one day, I thought I was dying. This is a few years ago. I had, a, had arrhythmia. So I wrote a long poem called Arrhythmia, but it really had nothing to do with that. It had to do with the condition that that condition threw me in. So that I was cast back into childhood memories. I, I was writing with my eyes closed, I think, saying, I'm going to die. You want to write something down because I thought, you don't get down now. But it, it, it wasn't written to make anybody feel sorry for me. And I think a lot of writing, because it's issue driven, is it has a kind of blackmail to it. It's a human, that the personality of the poet and that condition that they have, whether it's a disease or whatever, uh, overrides the, the um, ability of the poem to move you or engage you in any way. So I don't know if other people are experiencing that, but uh, up north, every book I'm reading, it, it has to do with, with some kind of um, politics, some kind of something that almost sounds cliche or it would be better off you know, in a, in a tract or an essay, but uh, but that's been going on for a long time. Poets as propagandists. Uh, I will say, though, in terms of form, I had a, a student once who came into class and oh, I just I did quit teaching, I think, because of this. He said, Shakespeare sucks. <laughs> <laughs> this was in a creative writing class. And I said, pardon me? He looked like that Columbine killer. I mean, this is bad. <laughs> Or one of those guys, and he was, he, he had a violent streak in him. They thought poetry would straighten him out, for God's sake, you know? <laughs> give, him, give him to McKinnon in creative writing, you know, he'll do it. <laughs> Shakespeare sucks. And uh, I eventually kicked him out of my class because he was typing and, and making, you know, he just wasn't participating. <laughs> so, there you are. Uh, I brought in a Shakespearean sonnet. The next day, and I made this class, made them, including myself. <laughs> I didn't have much time for, to prepare it. But the thing was that one of Shakespeare's sonnets, when you read it out loud or to yourself, you don't realize you're reading a sonnet. Mm -hmm. In other words, that content and the power of that content, yeah. when I consider fortune in other men's eyes, it is then, you know, you're drawn into to something incredibly large. And as soon as you start thinking that it's a sonnet, you stop reading. That's what happened to all of us in high school. And it happened to me, you know. Yes. You know, there's there's something coming up here that is uh, looking like a like there's two camps that the language uh, homo crowd and the and the other sort of formalists and, and people that are doing narrative and irony and so on. But one of the more interesting things that's happening right now is right down the middle, the language poets and the realists are coming together in this hybrid poetry. There's a great anthology, I can't remember the name of it, published around 2000 by Norton. It's all hybrid poetry. So it's, it's drawing from the language tradition and it's drawing from the new American poetry as well as the other stream. It's creating this new thing. Uh, so it's not completely obscure. Um, it has reference to the real world, and yet it's it's taking advantage of all the things that we've learned in the 60s as well. So that's something that people should check out. We actually have one question back here. Just I have uh, a question for Barry about um, Shakespeare and Shakespeare's poetry. Yeah. Um, some of the things you quoted from, and they were amazing, and they went by so fast, and I don't oh. know who you were quoting from, so I'd really like to know that. 
Emil Alcalé. How do you spell the last name? Uh, A L A C A L Y. And Philip Glass. Oh yeah. And uh, you can learn an awful lot by reading Charles Olson, as difficult as he is, and Robert Creevy. Mm -hmm. uh, my reading these days includes Emily Dickinson, who is just absolutely monstrous. Monsters? Well, in, sense, in the sense that... Uh, I'm a good monster. Uh, maybe it's an old usage of that word, but in, in music we used to say the guy's a monster, which is a man that can't play. So it scares the hell out of everybody, which is, I think the best poetry should scare us a little, because if you can't match it with your own work, you know, uh, and the last thing I want to say about reading is that everybody seems to think they've read Ulysses in you know, college. I think we all read Molly Bloom's soliloquy, <laughs> but I took three months uh, way down south, and I said, I'm going to read Ulysses, and I'm going to read every word. And I did. And it, this is Ulysses by James Joyce. <laughs> now, then I thought to myself, whoops, back to the drawing board. And then I thought, there is no drawing board. <laughs> so there you are, in the desert, screwed up. <laughs> Silent, just the wind coming at you, and dust, maybe a snake around the corner. Uh, <laughs> so James Joyce, and, and one of his sentences, you know, anywhere in that book, it, when I look at, you know, prose and poetry, etc., I just think, oh my God, that mind is just absolutely, it's up there with the Bible, you know, it's up there with, it's up there with Dante. Uh, <coughs> When I went to school, I didn't get to read, well, I mean, some of them are on the curriculum, but I'm just reading them all now, over and over, and it's humbling. It is. So, for me, it's not a matter of an older form, it's, it's uh, what's in that writing, how it, how it moves me, essentially, and uh, that's pretty much what I look for. I mean, if you're, a, if you're in a other context, like listening to music, some music would drive you out of the room, my mother said, Jazz is noise, man. It saved my life. Whereas my drummer in New York said, "Black guy said it saved me from going to jail," you know, which is probably true. But, but you know, so these art forms, uh, once you once you practice in them and enter them, it's an incredibly wonderful life. But what we're talking about is, is the range of, of writing, the uh, places where writing's been, and then. It's like maybe the, the map metaphor today. You've got to figure out your own cascadia in it, or your own boundaries in it. Your, how far, how deep do you want to take it? You want to take it down a thousand miles to the lower crust. You want to climb nineteen thousand feet. And, you know, it's it's really it, it's a, it's a it's a journey that, that uh, you know, involves I think that that kind of activity. So I'm reading as much as I can. Uh, I'm going a bit blind. But <laughs> It's necessary, and it's just it, just to keep me uh, so, sort of focused and humbled by you know, thousands of years, and, and to be part of it is just um, you know, a pleasure. You know, Mary, if they took Shakespeare off the curriculum, they'd have more room for some of that other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, I saw a question over here. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to just say something. Um, you're giving examples from American poetry, and um, I just wanted to follow up on what were, somebody made a comment about the book in fine form. Um, in Canada, there are poets right now who are using these forms and using them very well, and there's one right here. In the book, uh, in fine form, there's a beautiful uh, sonnet written by Yvonne Blomer, who is um, right here very prominent in this festival. There's a poet called Elizabeth Bashinsky in Vancouver a young poet who wrote a whole entire book of very fresh, um, very different <coughs> sonnets um, just uh, a few years ago. And I wonder if it's, I don't know, I don't know that much about American poetry, but I wonder if there's the same, if there's the same um, sort of taboo about writing foreign poetry and if maybe Canadian poets uh, are afraid of, uh, of experimenting with it. Well, if you look at, uh the Canadian poets, parliamentary poets laureate, uh, you've had people like George Bowring and Fred Waugh, 
And we get people in the United States who are a lot more uh, mainstream than that. So that's one, one take on that uh, that comes to mind right away. Uh, so, uh, you know, Dana Joya, who was referenced by George, is, was the head of this kind of new formalism movement. And, you know, just to, give him a sense, just to give you a sense of his politics, he was a member of the Bush administration. He was the head of the NEA, appointed by George Bush. So, you know, I think that the, the ethos of writing in fixed forms in 2015, I think, is a conservative one. And I think that, the, that we've had a century now, over a century, of making it new, in the words of Ezra Pound, which is what this book is riffing on. And, uh, and I also think that Dean's point that these are European forms that have kind of been spliced into this continent, that this continent, you know, it requires, our, our existing here requires forms that come out of, out of the soil here. So uh, those, are, those are some of the reasons why I'm not necessarily interested in formal poetry or seem to be more interested in stuff in which the form and content are, are uh, what, what did Denise Lepitov say? Form is never more than a revelation of content. So that the form for each poem is, is part of that creative process, that it is, that you discover it as it's going along. You know, Ted Berrigan wrote sonnets. They're not uh, Petr Petrarch, you know, they're, they're uh, postmodern sonnets and they're beautiful and the poetry, it just, it stands out. So there's a way to reinvent these forms. Um, so if that's possible and if the poets that you cite are doing this reinvention of it in, in the way of someone like Ted Berrigan, then I'd be interested in seeing it. Well, I'm somewhat dissatisfied with this entire discussion. Uh, <laughs> uh, because it, it has developed into a kind of incoherent, and I'm, I, I, I include myself in this incoherence, uh, argument back and forth about different types of poetry, uh, form poetry, uh, postmodern poetry, uh, uh, modernist poetry, etc. Uh, I'd like to suggest a completely different way of a question to ask about poetry, and namely that, that would be, does poetry have a future? Is poetry necessary? I was at another conference recently where the, the question was raised. I forget who, who was being quoted. Someone who said, poetry was necessary, and then the question arose, well, what, what, is, what is meant by the fact that poetry is, is necessary? To say? Because I know that that of all the students I've had, uh, probably 50% of them have written poetry at some time in their lives, and starting in grade school. So that might be one way in which poetry is necessary in that it's almost genetically necessary. But another one, another way perhaps, the, the, poet, the Nicaraguan poet Ernesto Cardinal was quoted at this conference, and Cardinal said, people need poetry like they need bread. So that's another way in which poetry could be necessary. But maybe we could uh, pursue that idea of, because we are talking about what, whether poetry has a future or not. Uh, were there more questions? Also, this, this thing of poetry being necessary, um, I just want to say that, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a really good question, so I hope that people take that up seriously. But there's someone up there with a question? Okay, so we, yeah. uh, Paul has well, to see, you know, your poem is the one that we chose to be at the beginning of the book, and you're sitting in the audience. So is there any, would you be, I hate to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want us to mangle the poem for you. <laughs> <laughs> I've never read it out loud, ever. It's new. Do you, do you feel comfortable doing it? Or? Good job. I could try. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to take this away from you guys. Oh, that's good. No. Okay. Um, so this is totally unrehearsed. And in fact, there is a word in the Tlopiat language that I can't pronounce. Um, it's spelled T-S apostrophe I-X dash W-A-T dash S-A-T-S. Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> take your word for it. Six. Six. 
Wow. I'll try that. Okay. It's called New Channel Good Advice. I've been told it's time to decolonize my mind, that all the places I love carry the wrong rhymes. Lone Cone, Frank Island, Catface, Colnet, dubbed by and for missionaries, kingdom come, imposing replacement. Xitswatsats, Chitapi, Wanachuth, Pilthuthith, more than pretty names, words that came up out of the ground as the loon learns his song from the lake. Try to cover a mountain in concrete, language keeps emerging, the planet speaking its green poems. The kind of petrifaction in pavement, the newcomers postpone mortality, preserve everything in hard gray, stop death by spreading it, lacks logic. Listen for green, learn the names. I've been advised not to study French or Spanish, rather to stand still, make roots from words, take in the language of the place I've made my home. On this business of um, poetry, whether it's necessary or not, and some of the comments that George is making, one thing I wanted to say that I was talking to my students about is like, how did you all learn how to read? Think about all those children's books, those very early things, and the mnemonic devices you've used throughout your lives to remember words, to remember meanings. Those are all poetry devices. And like some of our first reading experiences, they're poetry books. We call them children's books, but they're actually poetry books. So how could we ever let that go in a way? Of course it's necessary. But, so would you, we have another question up here. Well, back up here, okay. Uh, it's, it's more a comment I want to build on the, on the process of writing poetry uh, um, and voice. I think that we need to write, we don't write enough poetry, we need to write and write and write rather than edit. Uh, we tend to sort of write and edit back and edit back because we're trying to copy something or we're trying to, but and you have to keep writing until you actually hear that voice and then when you hear that voice then there's some integrity in the work, which is what we heard over here today. Mm -hmm. so I, so I, do you want to speak to a voice, or do you know what I mean by voice? Well, it's not exactly the same issue, but... Uh, it's Jeff, not an issue. It's, it's kind of a process where you, you, know, yeah. you hear your own voice. But Jack Spicer, uh, his idea of dictation is wildly popular poets, but I think that a lot of them misunderstood it and thought that he, because he said a poem should be dictated as if, as if coming from another source. Oh, and, oh, and a lot of people thought that that meant automatic writing. But uh, no, he, he, he was entirely in favor of revision. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with revision because if, if the true voice of the poem hasn't come through to you on the first draft, then you may need to revise to get stuff out, that, out of the way that is blocking the true voice of the poem. George, uh, George Bowering said, you know the book Craft Slices, George Bowering, short little essays on poetics, he said when a student comes in saying he's looking for his own voice or has to discover his own voice, George would get disappointed. But he's looking for poets who can discover what the poem itself wants to say. Yeah. So something that transcends the, the, the small eye and gets into that Whitman kind of big eye. And I think that's part of what I think that you're after. Yeah. To, you know, Eileen Miles talks about poets writing in the way of uh, Duncan and these people we talked about. And, and she describes it as being in a mad rush to be here. <laughs> you know, trying to get this all down wildly. And, you know, I, I think to get it down on the first take requires decades you know, of, of, of work. But we've all had that experience, all of us who write poems here, of how that poem comes out perfectly cooked right out of the gate. And I think it's a, a it's a trick to try and train yourself to write that way. Well, I'm not, I'm not against revision. I, that's not my point. I'm, my point is, is just to keep writing rather than writing and then going back and editing it wait long before you've actually put the words on the page. 
more along those lines. But yes, I have before clarifying. I have a bit of a comment on that, that many writers will say this, and it seems more true when it comes to different types of writing, but like revision is just another form of actual writing. And for some, writing doesn't even begin until revision does. And that's like the intense, difficult, challenging, mind-numbing work sometimes of, of writing. And I think a lot of writers have, have put this in print and like really identified with this. Um, and that's, I think that can be true of poetry and prose as well. There's a question over here. Um, I wanted to um, explore the concept you're saying, is poetry necessary, yet we had a comment, oh, but poetry about issues is ugh. Um, that was my paraphrasing. Um, <laughs> but I want to suggest that the very future of poetry is in that it deals with issues, and that the whole concept, the whole Cascadia poetry festival is yes. I mean, I went to a writing workshop with a wonderful poet, Robin Q. Telford, who in talking to new and beginning and aspiring poets, he says, don't write yourself a room full of, cru you're not writing a crucifix museum. It's not about, it's not always going to be about you and look at me and here's, here's my pain and suffering. And there are outside things. And, I, and if you look at all of the older poets, like Walt Whitman, for example, he, he wrote about issues. And the thing is, the issues will fade. And if it's a good poet and it's a good poem, and the writing is good, then that will remain. But at, but the birth, first birth of that poem might be something that is more, you know, that's what's going to get the public drawn in. And that's, you know, you know Shane Quaison's work and, and, and some of the stuff that the, the, the more populist type work going on in Canada right now. Anyway, I threw that out there because I think that's the future. Um, I can Jim, I can, I can comment on that. Did you want to comment on anything? Read James Thurber's book, Is Sex Necessary? Think about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually really welcome that question, and I thank you for bringing that up, because while we're talking about this thing, there's a little bit of contradiction and in, in things that are being set up here and what we're really talking about. And when I was hearing Barry talk, it seemed like you know, whether it's about issues or not, what really needs to happen is that the poem needs to be good enough to carry the issue. That's what like, I'm you can't saying, just yeah. be, like, you can't just go out and write about, like, you know, some some poor person that got run over and neglected. It's like, oh my gosh, it's like, that's not enough. You need to bring the art to the issue in order to carry the issue across boundaries. When we're referring to somebody like Walt Whitman or, or whoever we might be referring to, the poems that were most successful by them is the art that carried the issue across time. Right? And this is also straight out of Jack Spicer's poetics, you know, to carry things across time is significant, but you need to do the work for it. So issues, also, I mean, we're just talking about truth here, you know, like make it true. We're talking about, like, real things, getting in touch with stuff. So in a way, you're absolutely right. We are issue-driven in this poetry festival. We're like, hey, man, we're bioregionalists, like, we're curating this way. It's important to us. That's an issue. And so you're right, but we do want to, like, I think, you know, at least split ourselves away from things that are just about the issue itself, and then those that take the art to carry the issue across. And or the issues can, uh, if, if you're not, it can lead to cliché, is what I'm saying. Yes. If I've heard it before in, in, in an essay, and I hear it again in a poem, even though it might be, you know, more emotive in the poem, um, if the issue, you know, what you said, yeah. Uh, the, the, you know, there was an incident in Baltimore, Maryland, which resulted in riots that canceled two baseball games or postponed them and required the third game of this series to be played before an empty stadium for the first time in the history of Major League Baseball. And a man, Freddie Gray, was taken and his, I think his legs were broken before he even got into the van. And then in this van, they gave him, quote unquote, a nickel ride, which is what police departments do to uh, basically to, uh, to uh, abuse their authority. And uh, this man was left with 20% uh, uh, of his spinal cord attached. He was going back and forth in this van. And that is a pretty potent moment for poetry. And the poetry that I've seen come from that is rhetoric. It's very touching and it's very sincere, uh, but it doesn't work for me as poetry because it seems to be filled with generalizations and abstractions. And so uh, to talk about real issues, yes, but the, there's a difference between rhetoric and poetry. After the Virginia Tech shooting, I forget the poet's name, but she, we are Virginia, Virginia Tech, and she went on, and it was a very powerful moment in front of the crowd. Julia Toledo? No. 
but it didn't work for me as a real poem. And I, you know, I asked George, and I couldn't quite articulate it. And I said to George, I sent him the link, George Barring, and he said it's rhetoric. And I think there's a difference. And I think that you know a lot of what seems really exciting, you know, the, the whole thing between page poetry and stage poetry, it's what what can, what can hold that and goes beyond the abstractions and generalizations. Another test I do for the poem is I take out the line breaks and I put it together. And if it reads as a paragraph of mediocre prose, then I think it fails uh, quite often as poetry. So just a couple of points. One point I want to make is, uh, you know, we've talked about Charles Olson, Allen Ginsberg, Denise Levertov, Robert Duncan, Robert Creeley. They were the faculty, they were part of the faculty at the 1963 Vancouver Poetry Conference. And there was a brilliant documentary done called The Line Has Shattered. Robert McTavish, in fact, who produced that movie, is going to be here and hopefully answering questions after the screenings tomorrow, starting at 1 and Sunday at 1.45. So if you want to get a little sense of some of the, the substrate of what we're doing here, that movie is a good place to start. And, and I also think that that conference was really the seminal uh, poetry conference in the history of the spy region. That had happened in Vancouver as well. Do we, do we have any? Yeah, I think we have time for, for one more question. Also, I just want to say this might be this conversation that Paul was just talking about, might be where we actually need the formalist elements to create the art to carry the issue across, right? Uh, one more question? Is it more than uh, Just to, to add to the question that Paul was talking about, uh, the today is to write an issue-driven poem in a Trarpian <laughs> meter, sonnet meter. Okay, just please turn that in by Sunday evening. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this, is, uh, this has been really a pleasure to hear everyone's questions and comments. Um, I'd like to give out, again, special thanks to Ursula, who made this physically happen. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with these gentlemen and including this. Before everyone leaves, I'd just like to...